Joining me now, Rick Stengel, former Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy, and Amna Nawaz, who in January 2023 will be the next co anchor of PBS NewsHour alongside MSNBC contributor Jeff Bennett. So, congrats on that. But, Rick, well, both of you, I mean, the, the death of a two day old baby, it just, there are no words, but. After it happened, President Zelensky just a short time ago tweeted this. I have instructed our ambassador to the U.N. to request an urgent meeting of the U.N. Security Council following today's Russian strikes. Murder of civilians, ruining of civilian infrastructure are acts of terror. What can be done, Rick? What can be done? Yes, Chris, it's, of course, heartbreaking, and uh, there's no excuse for it. I mean, the idea of Russian precision missiles is itself an oxymoron. Uh, but... The, I think he's right about this Russia being a state sponsor of terrorism, as the car, your correspondent said, the European Parliament called Russia a state sponsor of terrorism. If you're attacking civilian infrastructure that has no military use, like an orphanage, like a hospital, then that is a clear violation of the rules of law, rules of the, the rules of war. The rules of war say you can attack infrastructure if it has a military benefit, but this clearly does not. And it just seems obvious that Russia has been a state sponsor of terrorism for a while. The only good news, and, 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 and there's no real good news here at all, is that Russia is running out of these missiles. Uh, all military experts think that Russia has already used up more than half of their missiles. So uh, the, the, the good news for Ukraine is that they can wait it out during, during the long, hard winter like uh, Russia did in, uh, against the Nazis in World War II. Of course, the problem becomes how many people and how many babies might die between now and then. And Amna, you hear about the power outages, no heat, no water. The World Health Organization warns millions of lives are threatened when you add in the coming winter, sub-zero temperatures. So there's the military aspect of it, but in the humanitarian aspect, what more can be done? Yeah, Chris, I think it's important to point out the two are very closely linked, right? The reason Russia has leaned more heavily into this uptick in aerial strikes is because their ground force game has been stalled. They have suffered a few humiliating defeats to Ukrainian forces who reclaim territory in the south and the east. And so there's an act of sort of desperation with a lot of these aerial strikes that do end up targeting civilian infrastructure and also critical infrastructure, power supplies, water supplies, people in cities across the country left without heat. And as you say, winter is coming. So we know President Zelensky has announced he's trying to set up what he calls points of invincibility, areas that are secure and open 24-7 to allow people to have access to heat and to power supplies and to water supplies. That will not nearly meet the need on the ground, though. And I should mention to you, you know, we've been, I've been texting with sources on the ground in Kyiv who have remained there from the beginning of the war, managed to stay and decided to stay for a number of reasons. And they tell me, I'm sharing with their permission here, that people are really doing whatever they can. There are parts of the city and neighbors of theirs who go days without water, without heat. They are trying to help each other to get generators, power banks, and firewood. But this one source also says, look, I think we could see another wave of refugees leaving and heading to Europe um, if these strikes continue and if situations become, as she describes them, unlivable there. But she also says, look, we knew and we all understand Russia is not stopping. We need to be prepared for a total blackout. So there is a very disturbing and I think potentially devastating winter ahead for millions of Ukrainians. I, I just uh, help us to understand the mindset because we have all admired on uh, uh, the resolve of the Ukrainian people. Having said that, when you're in the kind of situation they are in, no power, no heat, food, scarce, no water. I mean, you do wonder about decisions that are being made and, and how they have the wherewithal and what is going to happen now? I mean, is there a place for them to go? Is there something set up for what could be a wave of refugees when you realize at some point your kid could freeze to death? And I think the well, number of people Chris, I've talked to over the oh, last... Sorry. Oh, I apologize, Rick. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Amina, and then I'm going to go to you, Rick. I just wanted to share the number of people I've been speaking with over the last nine months, and we cannot underscore the fact that this has been going on for nine months, a war that many people thought would not last a matter of days. Everyone has their own circumstances and their own sets of decisions to make. I spoke yeah. with several people who made their way out to Lviv. Many others who decided to stay where they are have decided to leave. Since then, we've seen a number of European nations step up and receive a number of these uh, arriving uh, Ukrainian refugees, the United States 
states and, and as well has stepped up and said, if people here can sponsor you and you're able to make your way here, you have safe haven here. But the point I hear from Ukrainian citizens again and again is this. Their morale has not buckled. They stand firmly behind their president in this fight. And they say, what we need now from the world is unresolved support. We need, we need to know that you are going to stand by us. Give us the military support we need to beat Russia. That is the only way that this ends. Is there any concern, Rick, about support that Russia might get? For example, I know there are these reports that Russia is helping, or I'm sorry, that Iran is helping Russia, for example, build drones. Yes. I mean, the Russians are now availing themselves of uh, weaponry from Iran, from North Korea, neither of which is known as a particularly good military state. It's just a sign that uh, the, the corruption, the problems in the, in the Russian military, um, the thing I was going to say, Chris, before, is that there's probably no country in the world that has suffered more uh, at the hands of violence and authoritarian violence than Ukraine. Ukraine lost more people per square inch during uh, the 20th century than any other nation. They, they, are, they can endure. And in fact, the last thing I would say is, I mean, tomorrow is Thanksgiving. And one of the things I will be thankful for is the incredible bravery uh, resilience and courage of the Ukrainians who are fighting for democracy for the whole world against this authoritarian power. You know, President Biden has said we're uh, on this uh, at these crossroads between authoritarianism and democracy. Uh, the Ukrainians, at, at great risk, at great damage, at great harm to them, are fighting for democracy for all of us. And I, for one, will say thanks to them tomorrow. Yeah, we uh, often talk about if people want to support democracy in the United States, they should vote. And huge numbers of people did, particularly in battleground states. But when you look at what the um, Ukrainians have done, it is really extraordinary. Rick Stengel, Amna Nawaz, thank you both. Happy Thanksgiving to you both.